One common rhythm we never want to see when we're taking care of patients are ventricular rhythms. That is what we're going to be talking about today. Everything you need to know when it comes to ECG study around ventricular rhythms. Let's get started. So as always, we're going to start with our ventricular rules. So the big thing with ventricular rhythms is they're going to originate, like the name says, in the ventricles. That means that the SA node and the AV node are no longer working, and those Purkinje fibers are having to really start to kick in in order to maintain that heart rate. The big thing here, the big thing we've been talking about in all of our videos is that when we see a big, wide, and ugly QRS, this is where it is coming from. It's somewhere within our ventricles or our bundle branches. So anytime you see a big, wide, ugly QRS complex, know that it is always going to have bundle branch or ventricular in the name. That is the biggest key I can help you whenever you're taking those ECG exams, is that if the big, wide, ugly QRS is taking place, it's always going to have bundle branch or ventricular in the name. And as always, that intrinsic rate is also going to be a little bit different, right? With SA node types of rhythms, we're going to see 60 to 100 beats per minute. With AV node types of rhythms, we're going to see 40 to 60 beats per minute. Well, with ventricular types of rhythms, we're going to see an intrinsic rate between 20 and 40 because they're originating from the Purkinje fibers. So these are going to be much slower rhythms. They're not going to be good for the heart. But just know it's the heart's last failsafe in order to maintain life by having this 20 to 40 beat per minute intrinsic rate. So we're going to start with idioventricular rhythms and they are characterized by their slow regular rhythm that originates from our ventricles. We typically call these the dying heart rhythms because they're predominantly seen in patients who are on palliative care for end of life kind of services. This kind of rhythm is ultimately going to be lethal if it is not intervened because of its slow, slow heart rate. So let's talk about how we're going to break this rhythm down, starting with our rhythm. This rhythm is always going to be regular. If I was to march out between our R to R waves, it's going to fall in the exact same place every single time. The only difference is, is it's just going to be a very slow rhythm. Like we talked about, that heart rate is going to be very slow because of the intrinsic rate of our Purkinje fiber. So if we were to look here, we have one, two, three, four, we have approximately 40 beats per minute with this particular idioventricular rhythm. The P waves in this rhythm are going to be absent, right? We talked about that before, that SA node and those AV nodes are no longer functioning. So all of that electricity that's taking place in the, in the heart is only happening down here in the ventricles. So you're not going to see any kind of atrial activity taking place. Likewise, you're also not going to see a PR interval. It's going to be unmeasurable because of that lack of atrial activity. This is the first QRS complex where it is going to differ because we're going to see this big, wide, and ugly QRS complex, meaning that it's going to exceed that normal range of 0.12 seconds. This is ultimately due to the impulse originating inside of our ventricles using that abnormal pathway for ventricular activation instead of the normal conduction systems like we saw in our previous rhythms. So let's talk about the causes. Idioventricular rhythms can occur due to several serious conditions, one of them being a myocardial infarction, also known as a heart attack especially when the damage impacts the heart's normal conduction system pathways. Next up, we have cardiomyopathies, which are diseases of the heart muscle that impair its electrical conductivity. As always, if we see drug toxicity that's taking place, there are certain medications that can depress the normal function of our SA and our AV nodes. We also have electrolyte imbalances. So if the electrolyte imbalance is severe enough, especially when it comes to our potassium, our calcium, and our magnesium, it's ultimately going to infect, uh, I should say, affect the conduction of our heart. And then lastly, reperfusion therapy. This is huge. Occasionally, it is seen after a reopening of a previously blocked blood vessel due to a post-myocardial infarction or other causes. So when we talk about signs and symptoms, we're really talking about the fact that we have this significantly reduced heart rate and that's what's causing a lot of these symptoms. So we could see a lot of like fatigue and weakness that's taking place due to the poor blood circulation, um, lightheaded and dizziness from low cardiac output. We could even see like syncope that takes place, particularly in severe cases where the heart rate is extremely low. And then lastly, palpitations. It wouldn't be something you would really think of, but we do have this awareness that we have this slow irregular heart rate that's taking place. So that's what's causing kind of those palpitations. And then lastly, shortness of breath, right? So shortness of breath 
anytime the heart is struggling to maintain an adequate oxygen supply to the body, it's ultimately going to lead to some kind of shortness of breath of taking place. So lastly, let's talk about our treatment options. So we're talking about treatment, we're solely focusing on addressing those underlying causes and supporting a adequate heart rate and rhythm. So you are always going to see, unless you have a patient that is in palliative care, a placemaker that's going to be implanted. It is necessary because it's going to ensure that stable heart rate is going to be achieved and it's going to prevent the symptoms associated with those bradycardias. If it is a medication issue, like we saw with drug toxicity, we could have some kind of medication management that's going to take place and adjusting those particular medications in order to prevent this from happening in the future. And then of course, if it's a electrolyte imbalance, we're going to start to correct those electrolyte imbalances in order to bring the heart back to its normal rhythm. And then lastly, we have accelerated idioventricular rhythm. Again, it follows those same rules as our ventricular rhythm. However, the heart rate's just gonna be a little bit faster. This is again, anytime we have a heart rate greater than the intrinsic rate, but less than 100, we're gonna call these rhythms accelerated. So this is really key and important for you to know. The intrinsic rate for the Purkinje fibers are gonna be between 20 and 40 beats per minute. So if we have a heart rate that is an idioventricular rhythm, that is between 41 and 100 beats per minute, this is going to meet that ventricular criteria and we're going to call it accelerated. So the most common time that you might see this particular rhythm, this accelerated idioventricular rhythm, is going to be with reperfusion therapy, specifically thrombolytic therapy after a myocardial infarction. This is usually seen as a positive sign of reperfusion, but might also compete with the normal sinus rhythm for control of the heart rate. So you might see this rhythm initially and then ultimately it may go back into that normal sinus rhythm, but you you also really need to be very aware after reperfusion therapy that this rhythm doesn't come back because it is something that can occur with those types of therapies. So again, breaking down the rhythm, we're going to have a regular rhythm. When we march it out R to R, we're going to see that it's going to fall in the exact same place. Our heart rate is going to be between 41 and 100 beats per minute, hence the name accelerated. It's greater than the intrinsic rate, less than 100. We're not going to have any P waves because again, we don't have any atrial activity that's taking place. The SA node and the AV node are on vacation and the ventricles are taking over. So no P waves and no measurable PRR, PRI intervals. And then again, QRS complexes are going to be big, wide, and ugly. If you take a look at this, look how huge this QRS complex is. So yes, big, wide, and ugly QRS complex is going to be greater than 0.12 seconds. And then lastly, we're not going to see any abnormal beats. As for the causes, the signs and symptoms, and the treatment, they're all going to follow the exact same rules as we saw when it came to our regular idioventricular rhythms. So let's do some practice. What is it that we have here? So based on what I can see, if I was to look at our rhythm starting with that, it looks pretty regular. It's kind of falling in the exact same place every single time that I march it out. So we're gonna call this rhythm regular. If I was to count our heart rate, I have approximately one, two, three, four-ish um, QRS complexes, making it approximately 40 beats per minute. I don't see any atrial activity taking place here, right? Because we have these flat lines before each QRS complex. Complex. So we can say that our P wave is absent, which means that we're not going to have a PRI interval. And then lastly, our QRS complex. If I was to measure this out, it's huge, right? It starts here, comes all the way down here, and then comes up here. So we have a big, wide, ugly QRS complex. This one's approximately um, 0.22 seconds. And then lastly, do I have any abnormal beats? Absolutely not. So let's take a look at what we have here. We have a regular rhythm. 40 beats per minute, we have a P wave that is absent, and we have this huge caress complex. So the fact that I have that huge caress complex means that I'm either gonna have bundle branch or ventricular in the name. Based on the heart rate, the big QRS complex, and the regular rhythm, I know that this rhythm is an idioventricular rhythm. And then lastly, we have our last example. So we're going to do the exact same thing that we did before. We're going to measure our Q, um, R to R process here. If I was to measure it out, it looks like I have a regular rhythm. It's going to fall in the exact same place every time. So we're going to call this rhythm regular. Now I'm going to count our QRS complexes. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine up. I got approximately 90 beats per minute with this one. Next up, do I have any P waves? Not that I can see. Everything before our QRS complexes are pretty flat, right? So we're gonna say that we have absent P waves, which means we're not gonna have a PRI, 
PR interval. And then our QRS complex, is it narrow, normal, or big, wide, and ugly? If we were to measure it out, it kind of starts here, comes up, comes down to about right here. There's like a little notch right there. It's actually pretty big. So we can absolutely call this one a big, wide, ugly QRS complex. It's approximately 0.20 seconds, so much bigger than normal. And do we have any abnormal beats? Not that I can see, so we can automatically eliminate that. So based on what I have, I have a regular rhythm with a big, wide, ugly QRS complex, but it's approximately 90 beats per minute. So remember, anytime it's greater than the intrinsic rate, but less than 100, we're gonna call this rhythm an accelerated idioventricular rhythm. I hope that this video is helpful in understanding your ventricular rhythms. As always, if you have any additional questions, make sure that you leave them down below. I love answering your questions. Head over to nursechunkstore.com where there's a ton of additional resources in order to help you ace those ECG concepts. And as always, I'm going to catch you in the next video. Bye!